Welcome to worship. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, when Jesus made his triumphant victory as king into Jerusalem to ride into Jerusalem to win our salvation. The theme that will cover things today on this Palm Sunday is that Palm Sunday, it's just perfect. We begin our worship with our opening hymn. It is hymn number 234, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. That's hymn 234, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy, Holy and, and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, 
our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first of our lessons is the Old Testament lesson taken from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. Here the events of Palm Sunday are prophesied, that Jesus, the king, would ride in on the colt, the foal of a donkey. And it also talks about peace, that the overriding message of Jesus is that of peace, peace that people can now have with God because of him. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and brings salvation. He is humble and is riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be taken away and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His kingdom will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of God. The second lesson is the gospel lesson, and that is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, and will serve as the text for today's sermon. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, telling them, Go to the village ahead of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there along with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you are to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, that tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their outer clothing on them, and he sat on it. A very large crowd spread their outer clothing on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road. The crowds who went in front of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. We sing our next hymn. It's hymn number 133, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. That's hymn 133. Oh, Sarah, cry. 
on the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The portion of his word that we focus on is taken from that gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 21, the first 11 verses. It's just not right. I was listening to a radio broadcast out of Milwaukee, one of their AM stations, and one of the gentlemen on that radio show used that phrase over and over again. He talked about how a business in downtown Milwaukee close to uh, Phi Serve Arena where, the, arena where the Bucks play, how because of the pandemic and things that were going on, how it was going to have to close down and probably go into foreclosure and that would just be the end of the business. And he lamented, it's just not right. He talked about Summerfest and how Summerfest has been postponed for now into various weekends in September. We'll see what happens with that and those plans. And lamented over and over again about other things that have been postponed and things that have been canceled, things that are going on in Milwaukee and our state and our country and the world. And kept on using that phrase, it's just not right. It wasn't that he disagreed with the government decisions to stay safe at home or to have certain businesses being closed down and certain ones remaining open as essential. He didn't disagree with any of those things. It was because he was just tired and weary and he admitted it himself. That, that phrase, it was kind of more of an expression of just unbelief. Is this really going on? Is this happening in the world? This is the United States of America, after all. It's just not right. Maybe you've had something similar going through your mind recently. As you look around at things as the, the pandemic and the staying safe at home and the closing of businesses and the financial ramifications of things that are taking place now, as those things are becoming more and more real. I have friends, you do too, maybe you're going through this, who've already been furloughed from their jobs. Some have lost their jobs. We wonder, when is the stay at home going to be done? How many people are going to get to the disease? How many people are going to, going to die from the disease? And we look around and we wonder at all those things with, with homeschooling, doing homework at home, teaching my children from home, all kind of wondering, it's just not right. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're there on that day described in this text 2,000 years ago, on this first Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. And you're in the crowd, and you hear that Jesus is coming. And all of a sudden, you, you see the, the crowds start to, to form this, not quite a flash mob, but start to form this parade route for Jesus. You haven't seen him, but it, it's clear who he is. He's the one on, on the colt riding, this, riding through. You take off your outer clothing, your outer, outer jacket, whatever it might be, and you put it on the ground for Jesus to go on. Maybe you've cut down a few palm branches and strewed those, strewn those on the road in front of him as well, the path. Imagine you're watching Jesus go by in that colt. But imagine you're seeing the transfigured Jesus. As to Jesus, as he took Peter and James and John, only not that long before this event, as he took them to that high mountain, and he was transfigured before them. That this, this brightness, like the sun, that it emanated and it radiated from his body as he was showing those three men his glory, giving them just a glimpse of him as true God. His clothing becoming as, as white as white can be. His face beaming like the sun. Imagine you see that Jesus on the colt riding by you on that day. Maybe just maybe in your mind you're wondering, it's just not right. Isn't there something better for God to be on? Something more grand? And maybe you're wondering too, it's just that why is God here? Why is he here among us? And then in a moment of clarity, as you realize he's riding to Jerusalem, you think, 
That's where he's going. He's riding to Jerusalem where he is going to be confronted by those who want to kill him. He will be handed over to them. They will mock him. They will ridicule him. They will beat him and torture him mercilessly, taking that crown of thorns, plunging it into his skull, taking that whip that they would flog him with, with all the jagged pieces sewn into it, ripping apart at his back, and then die a horrible death on a cross. What seems right about that? It's just not right. Then, then you consider what makes it most backwards of all, and certainly something that's just not right. When you consider who he's doing this for, He's not doing it for people who are kind of good. He's not doing it for people who, they they got a shot of getting to heaven if they can just learn to straighten things out and, and get it right. Those kinds of people, they're imaginary. They don't exist. He, he's doing it for people like you and me. He's doing it for people like us. We're just not right with God. You and I may not have a lot in common, but I know that one thing you and I and all people in the world have in common. That every day of my life is a laundry list of reasons why Jesus shouldn't let me into heaven. We're just not right with him. We just don't get it. We can be petty and we can be bicker And we can hold grudges. I'm not going to forgive that guy. We can treat people's reputations as precious as about a a, a penny that you see laying on the ground that you don't bother to pick up. Our trust in Jesus at times resembles a cobweb as you can so easily just walk through it. Our desire to study his word, to be in his word, and to trust that he's watching over us and taking care of us. It can be as fleeting as a mist in a strong wind. We're just not right. There are so many things about Palm Sunday that just don't seem right. But then you consider God's promises. Take, for example, a promise like he makes to you in Romans chapter 5 where Paul says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All of a sudden, Palm Sunday then becomes just perfect because Jesus is there. He is there fulfilling God's promises, showing and demonstrating God's love to people. And and the the words that the crowds were, were shouting and proclaiming on that day, they nailed it. They got it perfectly right. He said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus was the promised Savior of the world. He had come on that mission from the Lord in the name of the Lord. And what was he coming to do in the name of the Lord, that mission that Jesus, that God had sent him on? It was to win salvation for all people, to give his life as a payment for sin. Truly, that word Hosanna resounded. The word Hosanna, it was a worship term. It means, save us now. We can proclaim that word even right now as we ask the Lord to save us from the things in the world that are going on right now. But most importantly, to save us from our sins. Palm Sunday is just perfect when you realize who was there, Jesus, and the mission that he was on and the mission that he accomplished. He accomplished your salvation. He carried out the perfect plan of salvation to make it so that you and I can have the assurance and certainty of forgiveness now and the promise of a life to come in heaven. His control was also there on that day. Who else could tell his disciples, go ahead to that town and there you'll find those two colts, those donkeys. Say this to the owners and they'll give them to you and then just come back. And it happened just like Jesus said that it would. 
always supremely in control every step of the way. Palm Sunday, it was just perfect. When you remember that Jesus was there. How has it been going for you lately? Have you been struggling or dealing with any guilt in your life? Have you been struggling with anxiety, stress, the uncertainty of this pandemic and, and staying at home, not knowing what the future is going to hold? Look to Jesus. Trust in your Savior, Jesus, who shows you again that he's in control. He is that mighty and that great king who rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday to make that day a perfect day because he was riding into Jerusalem to do the things that needed to be done to save you and me. As you look to Jesus and as you trust in Jesus, may he give you certainty. Certainty that you're saved and certainty that there's nothing in life that will ever be able to take that away from you or, or to separate you from him. I want to close by reading to you a section from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's in chapter 8 and it begins with these words. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Things on that first Palm Sunday we're just perfect. With Jesus, things are always perfect. Because in him, he gives you life, he gives you salvation, and he gives you the certainty of knowing that your King Jesus is with you. Amen. We make a confession of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we pray. Lord, we thank you for the perfect gift of your Son, and for the faith to believe in him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Cause the message of forgiveness in Jesus to provide hope, comfort, and peace in our hearts. Cause that good message to shine the light of hope throughout the world. There is a great deal of hurt, pain, and stress in our world. Calm our hearts. Help us to be still and to know that you are God and are reigning over all things. Give us the strength to endure and to face any adversities we are going through together and as individuals. If it is your will, help the pandemic to slow. Help leaders around the world to make wise decisions and to govern justly. Provide economic and material blessings to those who are in need. Bless us all with spiritual blessings found only in Jesus. We pray this in his name and also join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We sing our final hymn, hymn 333, Abide, O Dearest Jesus. That's hymn 333. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a blessed day with the confidence and certainty of knowing that just like that first Palm Sunday was just perfect every day for you and I can be just perfect knowing that we have Jesus as our Savior. God's blessings. Hi, I'm President Mark Schrader. 43, that's the number of first-year students now enrolled at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. It's a good number, the highest total in 12 years. There's great demand for pastors all across our synod, serving in churches like yours and around the world. Ethan Schultz is in his first year at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, but he's already a seasoned mission worker, having spent a year in Southeast Asia. Going to Southeast Asia was a very exciting time because you're, you're preaching the gospel firsthand. You're telling people that have never heard about Jesus. And those are always things that you hear about in the classroom, but to finally go and do that was, was an amazing gift. So it's very, very important that the seminary has placed a special emphasis on preparing pastors to serve in a wide range of communities and cultural settings. The seminary's Pastoral Studies Institute, for example, trains pastors who come from non-traditional backgrounds. Through our Pastoral Studies Institute, have opportunity to work with uh, sister church bodies really throughout the world in providing training. Um, and we have so many people that are reaching out to us for training. First. Could I ask all of you? Four years of training beyond college takes a significant investment, both for the students and for us as a synod. Increasingly, Wells members and congregations are offering special gifts to help these young men reduce or eliminate their debt so they can focus fully on service to Christ's kingdom. What's the promise in, in 315? the talent that's here, the enthusiasm, the excitement for sharing the gospel. Uh, I, I am so excited for the future as I watch these men train. As always, the students here are deeply rooted in the biblical languages, doctrine, and practice. And there's also a deep desire to serve God's people. I'm gonna get to use all the skills I learned here, all the skills I learned at Martin Luther College, I get to put them all together and serve God's people and show people God's love. You've got to go and meet people and, and learn about them 
and then you can you can personally tailor and deliver a gospel message to them and it's always going to be Jesus as their savior but that's the beautiful thing about the gospel is that that sentence that truth is applicable in every situation in people's lives Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary has a deep tie to the past and a strong vision of the future a vision for service to the Lord and his people at congregations like yours and around the world. While enrollment rates at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary are up significantly, the numbers are still lower than our peak in the mid-1970s, and there's no shortage of need. Many congregations have vacancies, and many opportunities go unmet. It's a reminder to always be encouraging to young people you know who have the potential for service in full-time gospel ministry. Please stand by for an important message from Pastor Cranky. We need your help to continue the ministry at St. John's. Hi, I'm Matt Cranky from St. John's Lutheran Church, here simply to address the fact that the expenses of running our congregation go on even in these difficult times. And so we do encourage you to continue making your, your regular offerings. We do have several ways that you can do that. You can simply mail your offering in, perhaps not money, but a check. You can mail that to 232 East Church Street, Jefferson, Wisconsin, 53549. You can also drop your offering off at the office. We are keeping some regular office hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 12, so it's rather limited. And we do also want people to be aware of and, and to observe the safer at home mandate that has come out. So maybe tie that in with a trip for groceries or something. Uh, finally, you can go to our website, www.sjlwels.org. And there on our website, you'll find a link for Give Plus. Through that, you can either set up a direct withdrawal from your checking account, or you can use the Google Play or the Apple Store to download that Give Plus app and set yourself up for online giving through a credit card. All of those options are truly appreciated and encouraged. God bless. <laughs>